Well, welcome to a new Harry's Garage video. And as you can tell, we're back at Silverstone Auctions for this one for their preview of their May sale. That's happening on Saturday, the 22nd of May. It's a Saturday and it start, kicks off at, um, I think it's 10 o'clock with the automobilia and then 11 o'clock for the motorbikes. This is the first Silverstone auction with a major um, number of motorbikes. I think there's 82 bikes. We're not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to throw some of the highlights from the motorbikes there as well. And then quite a few cars here. There's about 70 cars here in all. Um, so a real range from this at least to, I've got a McLaren P1 I'm staring at over there. Car number one. There's also a Ford GT as well. But we're going to, yeah, we'll get to those in a moment. I want to kick off here with these, this Lotus Elise. Now, these are getting more and more collectible. I know quite a few people are tucking these away because they were just such a pure sort of sports car pure Lotus and they're just refreshing as, as the world has got more complicated and gone electric and stuff. Having a little sort of 700 kilo Lotus tucked away just for those pure driving thrills is a great thing. And everybody wants the earliest one they can. And this is a 1999 example, series one with one owner from new. And that really takes some finding. Now he's just done a quite a re refresh on it. Um, 9,000 pounds worth of recent ex uh, expenditure it says on it. I know it's had some paint and it's had some um, brakes done a little bit on the engine as well, but what a lovely thing. And that's guided at 16 to 20,000 pounds. It's one of those, I would say that is money in the bank. They're, they're just, they sell immediately as they come up these uh, little um, Elise's. So it'd be interesting where that will be in five years time, but you're gonna have fun anyway. There is an alternative here. Now this Xenos, I knew the guys behind this car. It was some of the guys from Lotus and some guys from Caterham. They wanted to take on the Lotus Elise with a carbon tub car, a much faster car. This had the um, Ford, um, Ford engine, um, what's it called, EcoBoost based engine, 250 horsepower these, so dramatically more powerful than the Elise and carbon tub, Bittlestein suspension, still a manual gearbox. This is quite a rare one um, because it's got a windscreen. Not all of them had the windscreen. If you think of KTM crossbow and sort of thing, that's what this Xenos was all about. Sadly, they didn't succeed in a sort of full production run, but there are a few examples. They sort of work and they're now, you know, available at pretty good price. This is guided at 15 to 18,000, so almost the same price as the Elise, but a much faster car, more aggressive car, and perhaps, yeah, quite fun on track and that sort of thing. Right, another car I want to show you is this Ford Sapphire over here. Now I thought I'd show you this one, this Sapphire, because this is RS Cosworth, obviously, 4x4, four four, so four-wheel drive, but to find one as tidy as this, I can't believe it. This is a one-owner car, so it's 1991, one-owner car, and it has t uh, done a total of 13,865 miles. They just don't exist, but here's one. What I couldn't get over about this car is how, you know, in this colour, you wouldn't really guess the sort of performance potential of this car. 225 horsepower from that Cosworth um, four-pot turbocharged engine and lots of tuning um, potential as well. But look at the interior. It's a black leather interior with the most fantastic Recaro seats on it. You just want to clamber in and drive it. And it, and it looks for, I mean, you think this car is 20 years old now and 13 and a half thousand miles. Really, really nice example. Um, they're fetching some money now, and particularly in this sort of condition, but this is guided at 60 to 70,000 pounds. But yeah, that's one of the best I've ever seen. I quite like the one next door to it as well. Okay, look at this. Ford GT40. Obviously, this isn't a real one. This is a um, kit car, but look at the colours of it. Uh, my cameraman Tom doesn't like the colours, doesn't like golf colours. I really like them. Even if you just own this for the one trip to Le Mans a year, what fun are you going to have? Ford five litre engine looks epic, I think. It does look straight from um, off the grid at Silverstone or something. Been really nicely done. It says it's a professional build on it. Five litre engine, 1968 Ford, um, and the classic, you know, Smith dials in there, all the rocker covers. It really does look terrific looking around this outdoor filler cap. But value is just sculpture to me. 
42 to 50,000 pound guide. Don't know, I think that's pretty special to have in there. But look at these Subarus down here. Right, it's not often you um, trip over a proper WRC car, but this is Petter Solberg's Subaru Impreza from 2004. Did the um, Rally of Japan, and it's been completely restored by ProDrive Legends, and it's just mega to be around. You just look at this, and it was such a period in rallying. We were all watching the Subarus do their stuff and just that distinctive noise. I'm not quite sure what you do with this car now, whether you are going to enter it or whatever. It's quite interesting to see it in this sort of environment and this sort of sale. But looking around it, it is just an ornament, and you know it's just weapon grade out in the forest and presumably eligible for all sorts of rallies. It's going to cost you a lot of money though to own this car, 385 to 450,000 pounds for a proper 2004 World Rally car, Petter Solberg campaigned. If you want to save uh, some money, but still got quite a lot of cash in the bank, how about this? This is one of the very rare UK Subaru Impreza 22Bs. One of 16 examples of a proper UK car. There's a few that came in imported, there's around 50 of them in all, but only 16 were actually UK cars that then went to ProDrive. They did um, change the gear and stuff. This has been restored to as new condition, basically. He's, it was done by someone who was, um, who is owned by someone who worked at ProDrive. He's had to source some of the body panels from America, but it is absolutely beautiful and a real slice of history. And I'm told this is the first time a proper UK 22B has ever been up for auction. And it's utterly immaculate, faultless if you look at it. If you look at the engine on these, they're just a work of art. And that's reflected in the guide on it. This is guided at 120 to 140,000 pounds. I think it will probably fetch that as well because it, again, was such a moment in time and they are wonderful cars to drive and they make you feel like a real hero. I'm lucky enough to punt these around Wales, around the Evo Triangle and things like that. And it's something you never forget. And here you are, a most pristine example. Right, let's go have a little look at some of the bikes. Now, I can't tell you how many times I've nearly bought one of these, a little Honda monkey bike. And this is um, a limited edition gold plated one from 1996. They sort of reissued them. They came out in the 60s and 70s and people really did run around on these. And I've got, I had a friend back in the day, he was about six foot two. He had one and he used to turn up at our house at well, the cottage on his little Honda motorbike. Um, really cute thing, they all fold down, you do this um, with the handlebars, they fold down, you can sort of manhandle it into the boot of the car or something like that if you want to take your bike on holiday or something. But uh, yeah, very collectible. I think most of them just live in uh, at home now and they're probably living in people's houses rather than the garage because they're such a beautiful little thing. This is guided at about five or six thousand pounds and is done 16 kilometres in total from new. But I also want to show you now this one, MV Augusta, Monza 850 SS. This is the ultimate bike, and this is 1977, this bike. MV Augusta was winning all the equivalent of the motor, um, motor GP sort of events in that day. It was the bike to beat. Before the Japanese invasion came, MV Augusta with their sand cast four-cylinder engine, Agostini riding the bike, this was it. And the ultimate version was this, it was the fastest bike on sale in its day. It competed with the Ducati was the sort of just below it, but the MV Augusta was the one. Very rare to find a UK bike. Um, very few were sold in this country, but here this one was sold in this country. And now this is a highly collectible bike, and this is 40 to 50,000 pound guide but just look at it, it is just Italian loveliness of 1977. Proper bike, um, revs to 8,500 RPM and 150 mile an hour speedo. You'd know all about it if you were doing that on that bike. 
And then a bike I have never ever seen and didn't even know it existed until I saw it in the catalogue. This is a Moto Guzzi 254. This is a four cylinder 250cc motorbike. I only know Moto Guzzi really for their V twins, famous V twins, but this is 1979 and only a thousand or so were built. It's got a um, little yellow line at 10,000 RPM and the red line at 12,000 RPM. 250cc four-cylinder bike. That's 60cc per cylinder or something like that, isn't it? It's just the cutest thing. It's a bit of an ornament, but um, yeah, a little bit of Moto Guzzi history I didn't even know existed. I think this is guided at around the £6,000 mark, five or £6,000. Anyway, let's get back to the cars. Now, the one I wanted to show you next was this Nissan Skyline, the R33 of the line of Skylines. Now, this is a 1996 example, but it's a very special one, a limited run one. It is the GTR V-Spec LM Limited, LM for Le Mans, um, to celebrate Nissan going back to Le Mans, and only available in this colour. I didn't know this um, this actual version existed in this colour. They're generally either black or silver, the ones I'd seen. It comes with that registration as well. And you have to drive, if you're in a car in a few years, one day you have to drive an R33 Skyline or an R34. The six cylinder engine, twin turbo engine, supposedly 286 horsepower but I think that most of the power starts with a three four-wheel drive but very definitely a rear bias on it wonderful wrap round seats glorious sound they were quite an eye-opener when I first drove one of these they are quite special very special on the road now this one um, is coming from Japan in 2016 very good bodywork, etc. A little bit of tidying, I can see just on the wheels, a bit scuffed. The engine bay could do with a bit of freshen up, but they are very collectible, and people are now realizing what special cars these were. There's one thing that's got the biggest exhaust on the back of this car. I think I'd have to change that if I owned it. And this is guided at 58 to 68,000. So that just shows you where the value. These were 30,000 only a couple of years ago. But if you drive one, you soon realize why they fetch that much money. This one's just arrived, this Vauxhall 888. Now I remember these at Eva, I haven't actually got any information on it, but I've never seen one before. I remember doing a one page drive on one of the Evo magazines, but this is how it arrived from the uh, Vauxhall dealer. It had the Sparco seats, had the Oz wheels in this color and the wing on the back. It was about 150 mile an hour special car, two liter turbocharged, I seem to remember. I haven't got a guide on it, but look, I bet that's not a lot of money for quite a lot of fun. But the car I really want to show you here, look at this, it's another Corvette Stingray. Now there were several in the previous sale, so I know a little bit more about them, and I didn't realise that this split screen, um, rear screen, was only available for one year. I had a Corgi of this car as a kid, I just love that design. In fact, I love the whole design right across this car, the spinners on the wheels, the vents. We'd notice, I thought these were real vents, but they're not. Um, but they, it's all about the style of this car. The other bit I quite liked, it's got an um, automatic gearbox and it only needs two speeds because it's got the Monster Great V8 up the front. I don't know, I quite like these. Just for a bit of Americana and the style of them, 80 to 90 thousand pound guide should you want it and you can yes, this is known as a saddle tan metallic this color i'd call it pink almost but um, yeah great design here's another bike i wanted to show you now i actually have one of these this is the yamaha xt500 i've got this 1978 one this is the 1977 one they will they always have slightly different color tanks and things on it um beautiful condition this one very collectible these bikes they are such a hero bike in their day very clever little yamaha four-cylinder engine roller bearing all the way through they do have a reputation for um, tricky to start when hot that's the only downside and you have a little window here when you kick it over you get a little white 
indicator in that to show it's at top dead center and any swing and you have a bit of luck it will start and far away but once running they are just a delight you can see why they were so um, you know brought, got this reputation for being these really trick little bikes we didn't really do trial bikes this is sort of the first generation it also won Dakar in 1979 and 1980 but it's just a light flickable bike and everybody I know who has ridden one is a very memorable bike it's a thumper lots of torque lots of go and just great to look at Here's another one I really quite like, Butaco. Butaco um, sort of did trail bike, Spanish um, manufacturer, and they just won everything. It was, it was Butaco and Montessa were the bikes to have in the 70s, you competed in trials. But this is um, one of those. Something just to note on this bike is it's a kickstart on the left. That is very unusual on a bike. And also the brake lever is there and the gear change is this side they hadn't actually decided it's like left and right hand drive um, for bikes and which way round where your gear changes this is very unusual being the other way around i didn't mention the guide on that yamaha that's about um six and a half to eight thousand pounds to say very collectible this is slightly cheaper i think six to seven thousand pounds from like 1971 um Butaco now honda cb750 there's the very collectible bikes are the very first in production. This is a 1970s, this is a K0 bike with die cast casings. I mention that because the very, very first bikes, CB750s, were sand cast casings because they didn't really know if this bike was going to take off. And my God, it took off. It became a revolutionary bike. You, from, you look at the, some of the, uh, you know, the British bikes here, they were all kickstart, no electric start, etc. Leaked oil, little bits of oil. CB 750s didn't do that. Four cylinder across the um, frame, 67 horsepower, electric start, never went wrong. And this is what started the super bike revolution and the British bikes just didn't have an answer to it. This one is the collect one. So K0 means you can tell this has actually got its original seat, a little flare on the back of the seat notifies this is a very early one there's a k1 over there that you would just think was exactly the same but the uber collectors will notice the difference and they'll pay for it so this is guided i think at 15 or 17 thousand pounds while the um, k1 over there is half that it's six seven thousand pounds no difference in the bikes but that's what collectors chase is the k0 and that sort of signature that early detail of that seat and having an original seat is oh amazing it doesn't ride any differently but that's what happens in the world of collection right let's get back to the cars i thought i ought to show this one this is a 1990 bmw z1 you don't often see them this was going to be this revolutionary um, sports car from bmw Jorik Betts was the guy in charge of this division of BMW and then he went on to Aston Martin. Um, but he really rethought what a sports car, BMW sports car could be. And it was compact and it had this sort of unique feature, the door that doesn't open conventionally, but slides down into the sill. If I press that, up it goes. Just a bizarre concept, but it was to, um, I just sales give me or whatever but it was the idea you could drive around with the door low and you get more even more fresh air not only does the roof come off the doors go down as well this one i mean this uh, needs a little bit of tidying i have to say but um they are quite fun straight six um three these are engine in them as well this one's guided at 28 to 32 thousand pounds they've been sitting in the 20s for quite some time now wonder if they will take off one day Good fun thing. This <coughs> Alpina um, is just a very tidy example. 2000, um, year 2000, Alpina B3 cab, 3.3 um, um, straight six, 24 valve, 280 horsepower. Just a nice thing. 36,000 miles and guided at 15 to 18,000 pounds. And a very easy Alpina to live with. Another car I just want to show you is this Z3M. A bit of a Marmite car. I just know they're really quite fun to drive because, of course, they have the M3, the E46 M3 engine. So completely overpowered, bit of silliness, roadster. 
and um, with E46 M3 sort of taking off in value, I just think these are quite a good bit of fun. Um, 316 horsepower at 7,400 RPM. Not sure if I could live with the colour combination and the dark wheels, but it is a very tidy example and guided at 20 to 25,000 pounds. But I want to show you this. Now, if you follow Harry's Garage, you'll know that I'm a bit of a sucker for the Lancia Fulvia Segato. This is a 1300 example, so they're more numerous than um, 1300 cars, but they are just a sort of car that really gets under your skin and you enjoy. Now mine, obviously, um, I'm having issues with rust, which I knew when I bought it there was a bit of a problem. I've looked around this one, this is much better the condition than mine, the subframe underneath and where it meets the arch looks pretty solid. The thing about Lance's Zagato's or this Fulvia Zagato, part of the lightness that Zagato added was by using very thin steel. The industry standard for steel is one 1.2 mil thick um, sheet steel. Zagato used 0.7 mil steel, so much thinner steel than anybody else. So if you get a rust issue, you can get serious uh, quicker than uh, normal cars. But very tidy, unusual to see it all complete with the bumpers and things. Hasn't been messed around with um, the alloy wheels that it left the factory with. Very tidy inside, lovely. I'm going to just open, I haven't looked at the uh, engines. So I want to just quickly look at that. I haven't actually looked under the here yet, but it um, looks pretty tidy from the top. Oh, there we are. Yeah, all very original. Indeed. Yeah, a lot of fun, rarer than, uh, than you expect. And it is a genuine Zagato, Zag it is a genuine Zagato with the Z on the side. And this one is guided at 25 to 30,000 pounds. Really quite nice. Right, now a much more modern Lancia, a Lancia Integrale, and not just your regular Lancia Integrale. This is the final edition version of it. Um, the Evo 2, this colour is, this is the ultimate collector edition in many people's eyes. This maroon paint and this stripe was what the dealer final edition was. And uh, this is a very special example. Only one owner from New, which is quite remarkable, a UK guy owned this car, and it's done 5,400 kilometers from New. So it is as new. I've not seen one in this sort of condition before, um, because, yeah, I mean, it's getting on now, isn't it? It's 1995, this car, so what's that? 25 years old. So to find one with 5,000 kilometers is very, very rare. And that is reflected in its guide price, which is 145 to 165,000 pounds. Integral is a really going places these days, and that is about as good as it gets, this one. There's also these two Maseratis. We're not going to look at them now, but the... Maserati Mexico and the Maserati Ghibli over there, beautiful designed cars. But I want to show you this, because this is very, very rare. This is listed as the 1965 Alfa Romeo 1900 ATL. And you've probably never heard of ATL, a bit like me, but um, they were built in the 60s. There was this group of um, Italians who worked at Superleggera and other places, and they got together and made these sort of one-off cars. Well, this is one of eight, it's expected, of this ATL production. The trouble is, there's no sort of confirming paperwork at the time, because they just didn't do it in period. They just went down, they, they had a workshop near Lake Como and produced these cars with not a lot of records kept at the time. But you sort of look at it and say, wow, that's a pretty sp special car. Um, sort of Alfa Romeo running gear, the uh, 1900 SS engine and running gear in it. And you just think, this is just a Mille Miglia car, you know, it has to be. They had a red one in the sale at the NEC last year. I remember seeing it there and I really wasn't sure. I didn't know what it was and I didn't feature it and I've been kicking myself, but I mean, it's so good to get another one in because you just don't see them. Um, very um, slick bodywork, aluminium bodywork, uber lightweight. And then this um, way they make them, it's a tubular um, chassis. It's all hung, all the bodywork is hung on the tubular chassis. And this lovely twin cam engine. I think I might just lift it up so you can have a little look here at this, because it is pretty special. There we go. Alpha twin cam engine, 1900cc. Um, 
got an alternator on it, so it must have been an updated, but um, twin Weber's on that side, radiator, etc. very open because of the tubular chassis on it. Um, inside, very special, all sort of quilted out in the back, Perspex doors, flip up sort of petrol uh, cam, a very pretty Alfa Romeo, special bodied Alfa Romeo, basically is the way to look at this. And I think guided fairly sensibly um, at 140 to 175,000 pounds this one. The trouble is it's slightly lower value because it hasn't got the paperwork to support it, but it's plainly obvious it is an ATL, one of the eight cars made at Lake Como in those early 60s. Very special car. Now, I really like this. This is a very early 911 Turbo. 1977, three litre. You can tell it's the early one because it hasn't got the intercooler rear tail. It's just got an open tail. Slightly different design as we'll get to another one in a moment. <clears throat> Beautifully um, redone, bare metal respray in silver, black leather. Came in from Japan, I'm told, and it says it has a wonderful detailed service history, which is unusual with normal Japanese cars. But um, I don't think I've seen one as tidy as that. It's a shame it has, it's got the leather interior because they used to use that tartan interior sometimes you see, or the pasta interior. But lovely one and guided at 100 to 120,000 pounds for that. There's actually three turbos here, 932 turbos I want to show you. I also want to show you this one. This one confused me, because this is 1985 911 turbo, uh, but it's got a deep um, spoiler at the front, and it's got the side seals and the sort of vents at the side. Very interesting history of this car, because this was the person who's now selling it bought it in 1987. So just two years old, bought it from Dick Lovitz, um, and the story goes that the original owner was a very important Porsche client and he wanted to have a Porsche Turbo slant nose without the slant, <coughs> without the slant nose. And this is what the factory did for him after a little bit of um, to-in and throw-in. So the, the, there isn't paperwork to support the new um, car was supplied and done by Porsche, but in 1987 it's detailed then and it does look as though this was done at the factory, but there isn't the actual the paperwork to support it. But it's just a lovely example. I've seen the service book on it, fully stamped. And yet this car has only done 22,000 miles from new and owned by the person who's now selling it for 35 years. Wonderful history. So, and guided at 100 to 120,000 pounds. Sort of black Porsche Turbo 1985 small speed. And it looks great, I think, with that front air dam extended front air dam. And another one, 19, uh, what age is this one? 1988, silver, so still four speed. I quite like, if I was gonna have one, I did have a 930 turbo, I had the five speed, the G50 gearbox. I almost prefer the four speed now, because you get to enjoy the crazy turbo lag and the whoosh of the turbo more with the four speed rather than the five speed. Five speed's the better car, but I just think there's more enjoyment from the four speed and you just get that turbo whoosh. This one um, has done, I thought I had a mileage on here, hasn't got a mileage on it. Um, so this one is slightly higher mileage, but pretty tidy and the value looks good to me. 65 to 80,000 pound guide for that car. But if you want a cheaper Porsche Turbo, what about this one? 944 Turbo. I really quite like these. They're sort of rare, they're under the radar, if you like, but um, 944 Turbo was quite a thing, especially in this later guise. It's 1988 944 Turbo S Silver Rose, so a special edition. Now this one, um, very tidy. You, you look at it outside, it's got um, the special equipment, so the magnesium wheels on it, the 928 S um, brakes on it, 250 horsepower. They were quick things. I, yes, it is a manual as well. And this one is basically family owned from new and guided at 17 to 20,000 pounds, which I thought, cool, that looks amazing value. And I just checked the mileage inside, it's done 200,000 miles. So there's two ways of looking at this that, you know, after 200,000 miles, I, you can hardly tell from the outside it's done that so many miles. It's pretty tidy inside. 
I mean, you never guess the mileage. Little extra creases on the seats and things. But yeah, a very good value Porsche Turbo. Also, round here, I've featured these before, but SL55, this is a lowest mileage one. This is the F1 equipment on it as well. Good colour on it. Again, I just think these are still great value in the market. I really enjoyed my brief time of one of these, speed limited to um, 155, but easy to unlock. And that supercharged V8 engine, you will never get bored of that engine. They're very easy car to live with. 49,000 miles, this car. What else has it got? F1 performance pack, 8,500 miles. So it's 19 inch wheels, extra oil cooler. Oh, they've speed limits are raised to 300 kilometers an hour. So you can do 186 miles an hour and they will get there very quickly, in my experience. And uh, this car is guided at 22 to 26,000 pounds. Someone's going to have quite a lot of fun with that. Now, there's a bit of a British corner theme going on over here. There's Astons and all sorts of things. But I just wanted to have a look at these four cars here. This is a very early Mini Cooper in classic colours of the red with the black roof and the sort of vinyl interior. I've just picked this one out. This is 1961 and it's a 997 Cooper. It is the third oldest Cooper known in the history and all the people who look at these sort of things. So it was made in September, I think it is, September 1961. Perfect conditions, all fully restored and absolutely original and invited at all sorts of shows and things like that. 45,000 miles from New World indicated and 20 to 25,000 just a really nice example. And then we go to these E-types. This is a super early 1961 3.8 fixed head coupe, flat floor, etc. Um, looks really smart in the white. Just what a time this was for the UK car industry. That both of them, 1961, the Mini Cooper and this one. Left-hand drive, this one, as a lot are. 1961 guided at 125 to 150,000. But look at this one. Now, this is 1964 E-Type. Um, is it a 3.8 fixed head coupe? Red, it didn't leave the factory in red. It's been retrimmed inside, but it's been owned by someone who really wanted to drive it, etc. And it looks pretty tidy to me, this one. And this is where I just get confused on the value of E-Types, because this is an original right-hand drive huge number of exported right hand drive original is actually quite rare in e-type land um yeah one 1799 right hand drive and this is number 1738 so right at the end of the series one e-type um, production but big history file bluff log book as well 13 mot's because they haven't got a completely um, full history file and it's changed color from when it left factory this is guided at 65 to 75 thousand pounds that seems really good value for a very usable e-type to me no 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 i can't walk past this um elan same colors as mine i've looked around this and faultless. I, I, I has to have been restored recently. It is absolutely pin. It's still on an original Lotus chassis. It was owned by Steve Soper. He's had it for a number of years and now put it in the sale. If you want the most perfect drop head 1972 Lotus Land Sprint in yellow, well it's guided at 58 to 65,000 pounds. They're really on the move as well, the Alans as well. Just two cars, these stop me, these two, because they are uber low mileage examples. I have never seen a Mulsanne turbo like this. 1983, this was sort of the era when turbo came in for, for Bentley and really changed Bentley how we now see it. It was before Turbo R and that sort of thing, but utterly immaculate. The colour is quite fun. Yeah, Cotswold beige over Magnolia but it's 4,927 4, miles from new, and it is absolutely pinned. When you look at it, it is extraordinary. Just don't find them like that. And it's guided at 25 to 30,000 pounds. Never seen one like that before. And Arnard, I, I just feature this one, because this is sort of similar. This is later, 1998, Bentley Arnard, and this one is 6,000 miles from new and uh, offered without reserve. 
no idea what that's worth, but they are like new, the pair of them. There are so many cars I could feature here, TR2s, really nice. This Healy, um, this isn't actually, this is a um, 911S homage, but um, beautifully done. They just have written millimilia all over them. The, the little Jowett over there as well. These are quite good value as well. This, um, so X. K140 SE Coupe, 1955. Nice little mods done on this car, a usable example, guided at 42 to 48,000. Or if you want an XK150, there's one there. There is so many cars here. There's too many to feature, but there's two over there I have to include in the video. The P1 and the 4GT. I'm gonna squeeze just one more bike in. This Triumph. X75 Hurricane. I have never seen one of these before. I've only seen pictures on and this was sort of a US market special from Triumph to try and capture. This is, uh, I think it was 1975, the three, it's a Trident engine. So that's the three exhausts coming out about flared up sort of custom look. Think of Rally Chopper and those sort of days. This was Triumph's attempt at a teardrop tank, an actual production bike uber collectible now this is guided at 15 to 20 thousand pounds that's still got a drum brake on the front but anyway 4gt this was first registered as a uk car uh, registered at alan mann racing um, thousand dry miles since such a dramatic car unlike the previous 4gt that was sort of muscular in the v8 engine and it was sort of just a homage to the previous race in history this was the proper race car and obviously of alan mann and their le mans history and their race cars it's quite nice to own a, this car from alan mann direct they guide this car is guided at 600 to 700 thousand pounds obviously as new and it's got all the stuff that came from new with it and how you order it there's quite a nice little spares kit with it very different car to the previous 4 gt the 2003 4 car the one that celebrated 100 years of ford that is a very usable lots of space in it um, like an overpowered elise this one much more racy with that race spec the way it lowers down the wing comes up a very different a very modern statement of a race car as i suppose this is the mclaren p1 2013 this one this is car number one customer car number one and i have a bit of a soft spot for a Mac the mclaren p1 it's just a wild car when you go in it mclaren is all clinical and sensible p1 does not feel sensible when you're in it it's a huffing puffing turbo all you hear is a very angry turbo it wants to go on boost and you get the battery boost as well and it's just to go really really fast i had the the good luck or misfortune i'm not sure which to join chris goodwin at the nurburgring when he was trying to set a lap time around the nurburgring and i've done a six minute something i never found out what the something was around the nurburgring with him in a p1 and it was a <laughs> quite an experience to, to say the least so yeah lovely to see this car here um, I think it's it's not many miles this one's done it's first customer car I'm gonna have a quick look 3,666 miles from new 0 to 200 kilometers or 0 to 124 miles an hour in 6.8 seconds I just it was there with the 918 and the La Ferrari. this was lighter you couldn't go on electric only with this car this was all about speed and uh, yeah one of 375 and guided at 885 to 985 thousand pounds well there we go quite a sale hope there's a bit of a rush to go around all these cars and, and the bikes but i hope you get a flavor of what this sale is about um, sale dates is that saturday 22nd of may car auction is at um, two o'clock in the afternoon bikes are earlier 11 o'clock in the day you go check out all the details they're all on the silverstone um, website silverstoneauctions.com um, hope you enjoy this video if you have well keep watching keep subscribing more videos coming along very soon